Hi, welcome to the Signal Path. In this episode, we have another repair video. This is an Agilent 8611-8A. This is a remote sampling module, but this is a 70 gigahertz version. And because it has so much bandwidth, the connections for the RF input are not in the front of the module, but they are rather in a remote head, allowing you to bring the remote head really close to your circuit. This is very beneficial, of course, because the circuit that has 70 gigahertz of bandwidth, you don't want to pass that through any cable, allows you to basically connect it directly to your circuit, whether it's on a probe station or in a module. These are typically used for optical experiments and so on. Uh, so this particular sampling module doesn't work. I'm going to try and find out what's wrong with it. Now, keep in mind that I don't recommend you buy these things broken because if they are broken in the head, you basically have almost no chance of fixing them because the front end I see that's in here is completely custom made by Keysight. It's not even in silicon. It's a, you know, some 3.5 process they have and all the magic is in here. Everything in here is low frequency analog. That's why you can have such a long cable between the two things and still have 70 gigahertz of bandwidth. These are sampling modules. Basically, only the front end has 70 gigahertz of bandwidth. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because of the Patreon supporters because of you guys we are able to do this in fact i did something similar with a 30 gigahertz probe that i bought and did a tear down in the previous video and a couple of videos ago and it was the same situation i just bought it so you guys could see what's inside nonetheless we're going to try and see what we can do with this and uh, looking at this the connectors you know i put it i put a 50 ohm termination here just in case you know just in case we can fix it we shouldn't abuse it you can see the connector is pretty dirty so it hasn't really been taken care of that well. Uh, and these are, of course, V connectors, which have a cutoff frequency of 67 gigahertz. But yeah, they look, it still looks fairly good. And we should be able to at least take a look at it. The module itself, it seems to be in reasonably good shape. This cable has come out of the you know, of connector here. We have to fix that. Other than that, really nothing unusual. So let's plug it into the instrument and see how it behaves. And maybe we can find out what's wrong with it. Okay, so here is the device plugged into a DCAX. You can see it's on the left module, so we're expecting channel one and channel two. I do see a signal, and I don't see this signal being stuck in the top or the bottom of the screen. The screen is, by the way, really reflective. I don't like that. So let's see. Let's enable the second channel. Okay, that's actually a pretty good sign. So typically when these things fail, the front end is burnt or damaged, and so, yeah, sometimes this trace is stuck at the very top or at the very bottom, meaning that you know it's basically destroyed. So it's not doing that. That's a good sign. We can try and calibrate it. Let me go ahead and zoom in a little bit in here. At least maybe you can see it better. Sorry for the awkward angle here. Let's see here. Tools and calibration. There you go. So it's not calibrated. Let's try that. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so it's calibrating. Ah, the calibration failed. Yep, so there is indeed something wrong with it, and it failed right away on the first channel. So let me see if I can calibrate the other channel, because it's starting from this one. Let's not do this one, and let's see if it can calibrate that. The second channel. Oh, that is a really interesting thing. Look at that. The second channel is beginning to calibrate. So we can see if it goes through the calibration. That's an interesting find. You can see it's going through various DC offsets, calibrating the front end. Remember, it's not calibrating it against time, of course, because it, ca it cannot do that, but it's, it can still calibrate all the different values. Yeah, it's con continuing. It's so far successful. There you go. Succeeded. Interesting. So that's, uh, there you go, channel 2 succeeded. So the channel 1 does not calibrate. So we can focus our, our attention on that. There's a few things we can try. So for instance, let me do that again. Oh, it's starting to do it. That is interesting. Look at that. It just failed. Oh, there you go. It failed again. Ah, so it's intermittent. It sometimes works and sometimes doesn't work. That's also an interesting find. So there's a couple of things we can try. Uh, we can, of course, switch these two from the inside of this inside. We can swap them on the inside of the module and see if that calibrates. If it always calibrates, that means that one of them, uh, the problem is in here. Or we can find out if the problem is in there. There's a couple of things I can try uh, based on my knowledge on how this thing works architecturally. Let's go ahead and take this apart and take a look inside. And we can do some experiments before we go anything drastic like switching these. So I ran this calibration a few times and in fact I could get it to fail even on the other channel every once in a while. It means that the problem is probably not in these heads because if they were, you know, if this was totally dead, it would always fail on this one and, you know, this would always succeed. If it's intermittent, it could potentially be from the interface of this guy to there. And I don't think it's because of this broken cable here because this is still many, many uh, cables in there. We can take a look at it. So yeah, let's see. It's interesting. Now, I have to find a way to make a connection to the inside of that instrument. So if you look at how this connects, hopefully we can get zoom in there. So it has what appears to be very similar to a DB25 connector. I, actually, I think it is exactly that. It also has an RF connector that you can see all the way next to them at the top left and the top right. And those are where the pulse signal, the sync signal is sent into it. So those are the strobe signals that go into the step recovery diodes in the sampling head that ultimately create the really sharp edges needed 
for the 70 gigahertz bandwidth. So all of that magic is in the remote head. But given that those are just DB25 connectors, I think I can use a parallel port cable to bring those signals out so we can operate the module outside of the unit. That would be a huge help because we can probe it right now that you have no access to this. There you go. In case you're wondering, here's the back of the module. Indeed, this is a DB25 connector. All of these are blank. Uh, so only this connector is used, so yeah, it makes it really simple. Strobe and all the configuration, analog readback and power and everything through here, we should be able to make this connection. There's a lot of, of course, empty places here because this chassis is uh, the same for a lot of different configurations. And now Keysight has half modules where only half of this is occupied. You can get four channels up to, I think, 100 gigahertz uh, per only one-fourth of the chassis size. So it's quite really amazing. Uh, maybe we can get our hand on one of those in the future videos, and I'll show you how those work as well. Well, I went ahead and picked up something else from eBay, and this is, no, this is not the inside of the 70 gigahertz uh, module there. This is some uh, CDR module, pretty old and obsolete, even though it's really complicated. And I needed it because I wanted to get this cable out of it. This cable has this connector. This connector is the connector that mates with the connector in the back of the DCA-X and I needed that in order to bring the strobe function out so I can connect it to my unit over here. So that's why this was necessary. No, I just basically only wanted this cable from this module, but this was I think about $50 or so. It's totally broken. It's a 2500 um, megabit per second uh, CDR module. It actually has an optical input. That's why there's so much fiber in there. This has a failure up here, if you look closely. You can see that there has been some kind of a minor explosion in that corner, so something's happened to this. But, you know, this module itself deserves a teardown because it's a pretty interesting optoelectrical module. We'll save this for later. For now, we can use this cable. And here is the inside of the Azure 8611-8A module that goes inside of the instrument. And there is a lot of analog you know, circuitry here. We can do a, a little bit of architectural analysis. First of all, there are a ton of DACs, a lot of digital to analog converters. All of these components you see, these are all DACs. And this is not surprising. Often when there is a 3.5 or gas or some kind of a process involved in the front end of a very high speed device, there are a lot of analog voltages to support it and to calibrate it and to provide various signals in order to do this you know, self calibration that we were seeing. So that's not abnormal. There is also a 12 bit a to D there, I'm not sure if this is the main sampler of the instrument. Remember that once the signal enters this board, it obviously doesn't have 70 gigahertz of bandwidth anymore, it's a very low frequency signal. In fact, this module only samples at about 40 kilohertz, except for the fact that it samples it with extreme timing precision. So if I look over here, the only really analog signal or maybe high speed signal that's passed onto the module is the strobe signal coming in. Now this strobe signal has very precise edges, but its repetition rate is very low. Like I said, about 40 kilohertz. It goes into the board, looks like a bunch of transistors or amplifiers here in the front end, and splits the signal into two, and simultaneously and symmetrically sends those two signals out into the remote head. And those remote heads then convert this sync through a step recovery diode to a very, very fast pulse, which then samples and then brings the signal analog back out over here which is then digitized and sent through this back onto the instrument. So the architecture makes sense. This is what we were expecting to see. In the other modules where the sampling is actually inside, you can see the, the sampler as well as the step recovery mo module directly on a board here, but that's not here. That's all in the remote head in this case. So switching these is also fairly easy because it looks like we just swap these two connectors and that's it. You don't even need to swap these because these are symmetric anyway. So then you can find out if the other channel is working. So I'm going to focus on bringing the signal out of the unit, connecting it to this DB25 connector on this side, bring the strobe in, and then we can you know, trigger and figure out what's going on here. We can put oscilloscope probes in various places and measure the power supply voltages and see if we can find anything wrong, especially because our problem seems to be intermittent in some ways. I think that's going to be exciting. Okay, here we go. Here's the connection. So here's the strobe coming out and going into a new cable. Here's our parallel port cable going in. The DB25 is pretty easy. The strobe is a little bit more complicated because I don't have the connector to connect to the back of this anymore. So I basically removed the strobe coming in from here, replaced it with another cable, and that cable now connects to the unit. So that should all work out, hopefully. And the next thing is turning it on, and let's hope that this doesn't burst into flames. And check it out, the unit gets detected again, and I did a few calibration, and indeed I see the same result. I even swapped these channel connectors, and indeed it fails much more frequently on the other channel than on the first one meaning that the problem is not from the remote head that's a huge relief because that's a problem that i could not fix so now we go back over here 
and there's a couple of tests we can do. Uh, what I think we should do is measure the power supplies, like I said, but si since swapping this back and forth didn't help, I'm going to work backwards and look at the signals that enter these modules, including the strobe as well as the analog ones, as much as I, I can, to see where the difference between the two of them is. Why is, the, why is one of them failing more often than the other? So I went ahead and I did a whole bunch of, you know, analog measurements on this power supply. It's really nothing that exciting. And the channels seem pretty symmetric. I couldn't find any differences between them. So the next thing to measure is to measure the strobe signal. And I basically disconnected two channels. Here's the first one, here's the second one. These are the two channels they used to go into the board. Instead, I'm taking two cables out from where those connectors used to be, which means that the strobe signal that enters the instrument and splits into two, I now have connected it to the two channels of the Keysight MSOX6004. This is a nice compact unit that fits here in the desk. And we're going to see if we see anything coming out if there is any difference between the two strobe signals, that's really what I'm looking for. And to be fair, Pooch is really the mastermind behind this test. He is making all the suggestions on what to do. And check it out. I think we found something. There is indeed a difference between the two of them. I see the strobe signal on one of the channels, but I don't really see anything on the other channel. Let me zoom in here. So you can see, these are, there you go, these are the little pulses coming out, and there is nothing that's the equivalent one on channel one here. Remember, these pulses are, they don't look very good here. It's probably because the front end maybe is damaged. Uh, the front end amplifier for the strobe isn't working. But yeah, I see some ringing there. I don't, shouldn't really be seeing that. But if I zoom out, you can see, if I go over here, what is the rough frequency? So we have right now, we're looking at... Yeah, but, but I would say half after the 30 microsecond, yeah, it's about uh, 40 kilohertz or so. That's exactly what we were expecting to see from these pulses. The repetition rate is about 40 kilohertz, and there is nothing on the other channel. So this is a huge, huge find. And now we can go ahead and remove the board and take a look at that front end amplifier and see what's happening to it. So here's the board outside of the unit. There are a couple of things to notice. So here's the amplifier section, strobe coming in. These are the two outputs we were looking at. So we can go ahead and focus on here. A little bit more and you know I don't see anything unusual here uh, I do see this is clearly a two-stage amplifier so we've got two transistors here and then two transistors here so the signal splits right there between the two of them and then this goes into this stage and goes out I looked up the part number of this I'll put it up on the screen it's nothing unusual it's just a bipolar transistor it has a reasonably okay low noise figure and I think it has an FT of about 8 gigahertz you know, ideal for an application like this. And to me, it looks like that we have a, an emitter follower, a common collector amplifier, followed by a common base amplifier. So it's just a buffer, basically, to buffer this into these two outputs. So I can go ahead and measure these transistors. We can measure the base emitter forward ju junction voltage of each of these bipolar transistors. Let's go on the channel that was working. I believe that was this one. So I think I have this backwards. Sorry, one second. Here we go. Here's the base, and here's the emitter. And what do we have here? Can I catch anything? There you go. 0.797. That sounds about right. Let's measure on the channel that wasn't working at the input. Here's the base, and here's the emitter. And look at that. It's not the same. It's actually quite different, and uh, significantly so. Let's measure the other one that follows it. Yeah, this one's OK. So all these four transistors are actually identical, and there's only one of them that measures quite a bit different than the other one. So I'm inclined and replacing that one. Yeah, it's different. I'll go back to the other one just one more time to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Yep, there's indeed a big difference between them. So it may be that that transistor is you know, damaged in some way, and that's why it's not working. So, but I do think what I should do is replace Move this out of the way. I think I should replace at least the first two transistors so that I can create a, a symmetric input. Uh, right now, even if this transistor is working and this one is not working, uh, I, I need to have them to be identical. So the signal coming in sees two identical transistors, and these two final stages both check fine. So if I leave them, they remain symmetric. So I think I'm going to go ahead and replace these two. I just have to order some from DigiKey and then change them. OK, we did a replacement here. Okay, here we go, and check it out. I think we have success. I think these two channels are now perfectly symmetric. They're indeed exactly on top of each other. If I zoom in a little bit, you can see a slight difference between them. Now we're getting exactly the same thing on both. Here, I can separate them just so we can make sure they're exactly right. Yeah, I'm quite happy about that. Uh, we can change the acquisition to averaging, and we can make a lot of averages. So we can just see what happens here. It's 2048 
averages and you can see the signals are really quite similar it doesn't have to be exactly on top of each other but you know this this is adjustable actually and it's one of the capabilities of this module that you can align them with respect to each other so i'm really quite happy about this now we should put it back together and see if the calibration works well here's the moment of truth let's give it a try let's see ah look at that that's a pretty good sign it is moving it certainly wasn't moving before so let's wait for a while and see if this completes and it's, it's going to do that of course the first channel followed by the second channel now the second channel used to fail periodically but uh, i guess the important thing is if this channel actually succeeds so let's keep going come on you can do it you can see how the line becomes thicker that's for very small divisions oh look at that it succeeded that that is great so that actually worked. It's the first time I've ever seen channel 1 uh, succeed calibration. That's a really good sign. It's doing the same thing again on the second channel. So these are obviously different scales and different offsets that can be applied for the front end amplification. These are done probably, I would say, post sampler. I don't think this thing has an amplifier in the front end that's 70 gigahertz wide. There you go. Successful. That is awesome. This is a beautiful thing. There we go. So now the only other thing to do is, is actually do some measurements. Can it capture any meaningful eye? eye diagram or something like that and I think I'm going to use this instrument up here this, uh, the Agilent any N4901B I've repaired this in a different video definitely I suggest that you check it out so let me hook that up okay so here's our test setup I have the data minus and data plus of the bird directly going into the two remote heads this way we can test them simultaneously and we can measure it you know the skew between them and see the alignment and unfortunately I don't have a precision time base you do need a precision time base if you want to make jitter measurements with a flow noise floor of better than 300 femtoseconds or so and I think the latest versions are even quite a bit better than that they could be sub 100 femtoseconds especially with a 70 gigahertz set you have no choice but if you want to do a pattern lock you need the front end trigger anyway so that's how we're going to test it and maybe in the future if I can find a precision time base somewhere we can try that as well so right now everything is disabled so obviously there's nothing displayed there but I'm going to go ahead and zoom over here enable the output and see if anything comes in all right here we go you can see there is a tiny tiny dc offset on this and this is the same on both channels so this is definitely coming from the bird itself so the termination inside of the bird is not perfect and i think i remember that when i was fixing it so let me go and enable the output and oh yeah check it out this is really nice this is a 10 gigabit per second sequence here at 2 to the, my, 2 to the 11 minus 1 prbs so these are the two outputs you can see they're indeed not symmetric again i do remember that there was an issue with the birth that there was a slight difference between the two channels we can try and make a differential signal out of this and turn the differential on and i can go under advance here and do a self-alignment just to make sure it's really aligned and the way this instrument does self-alignment is that it runs a cross correlation between the samples from the two channels and does a phase shift until it figures out the strongest correlation there it is it's done let's see what the eye looks like Oh yeah, look at that. That is a beautiful signal. Let's uh, turn on the eye mask. Let's see. Oh yeah, look at that. That is clean. So for a 10 gigabit eye, again, there's no channel here. So there's very little eye aside. I do see some imperfections. You can see there is some uh, limit. The, the slope here changes uh, at the very top and the bottom. So there is uh, an issue with the driver. I think this is just the best they can do. And there is some duty cycle distortion. You can see the zero crossing is off. That probably has to do with the DC offset that was originally part of the signal we can actually capture the pattern let's lock to it and do some jitter analysis and press the jitter here let's see what we get i think it's figuring it out oh yeah no problem look at that it's caught all the edges already it's a fairly short pattern so it's not too difficult the random jitter is nice and gaussian the data dependent jitter does have two edges in it that's interesting it could be a little bit isi related you can see the total jitter does have these two humps which come from these two data dependent jitters the eye is still fairly open yeah it looks really good let's go back to the eye mask once again and let's look at that eye again oh yeah look at that that is really nice that's uh, again to be expected from a bird uh, i don't like uh, some of these imperfections but honestly i think the output driver is not very good overall i would say yeah pretty good repair very happy with it as always this would be impossible with other patreon supporters i really appreciate that and uh, maybe you want to see what's inside one of these modules if you do let me know in the comment section i'll try to open one of them in the future to show you they're working so i'm a little bit reluctant to open them and they may be inside a fully sealed hermetically sealed uh, portion but you may not be able to see the front end anyway but if you're still interested uh, I, I don't mind trying to open one of them so you can see what it looks like as always i hope you enjoyed the video i'll see you in the comment section <laughs>